Well, um, perhaps I will, before we start, I'll, I'll give you very briefly our background, how we came, how we came to Huxley, and uh, then it would be nice if you could first, uh, like, uh, uh, I thought of dividing this hour into like a th three parts. One, uh, one would be your way to Huxley. And then we thought it would be interesting to hear something about uh, Huxley's political views, especially I saw, I haven't read it, but I saw the uh, the essay there, Politics of Ecology, I guess it was, right? Yes. And then I'm reading, I'm, I'm avidly, avidly reading him now, and just out of my personal curiosity, I started with The Witches of, or uh, Devils of uh, Ludon. Yes. Uh, it would be interesting just, uh, just to finish on that note, perhaps, uh, on, on, on that, on the place of that book. And I, I, just, I just finished also the, the uh, uh, After Many a uh, Summer, that was also very, uh, so that was, uh, but um, uh, before we start, very briefly, where we, how, how did we uh, uh, end up with Axel now, and what what has been our road to him? We do a great books course here in Estonian Business School, and this is our eleventh season now. We started with Thomas Mann, Magic Mountain. That was the first idea. Uh, that that was the, when I got the opportunity to start. Then the, I knew that's the first book. I didn't know what the second book was, but then. Given the uh, situation outside, uh, it had to be Orwell. Uh, from <laughs> so from Orwell, we moved. Uh, from Orwell, I got into the Western philosophy. Then we did Bergson and Goethe uh, next, uh, fourth and third and fourth season. Then we did uh, Melville because American elections, uh, Moby Dick. Mm -hmm. Then we jumped to Russia, Dostoevsky, Brothers Karamazov. Uh, then we had a course on Reformation uh, based on the Estonian local writer who has written on that subject. Then we did Homer, then Joseph Conrad, last uh, season William James, and now through, through James uh, to, 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 to Huxley, would, I think would, that would be the, the uh, logical uh, step there. So it would be very yeah. interesting first to hear how... How did you how did you find your way to, to Huxley? That would be the, the first question. Well, um, the first book by Huxley I read was Brave New World School. Um, and there was a very big shelf uh, in the library at home full of books by Huxley hmm. uh, that I avoided <laughs> because uh, my father uh, was um, you know uh, specialized in in Huxley, um, and it was only later on in life, um, in my mid thirties, uh, when my father started writing that enormous study of Huxley's complete works, that he invited me to oh, with this book then yeah that's the one uh to to follow him uh in his uh in his um project chapter by chapter by reading the books uh by huxley and then uh comparing them with uh the impressions i had uh in my father of, of my father's book so i was a sort of sounding board for my father and then uh, when he died in the year 2000 um, I was offered his position um, on the board of curators of the international Aldous Huxley Society uh, and I was quite terrified because I didn't know a fraction of what my father knew about Huxley mm -hmm. and felt rather inadequate but at the same time, I thought it would put me under pressure um, in my uh, early 40s to keep my interest in literature alive uh, while busily running a private school. And uh, the discipline of that I found incredibly beneficial. And, and more recently, I thought, well, I actually need to deserve that position 
uh, on the board of curators at some point in life and actually do my homework. So uh, I uh, started by setting up the center in Zurich because I knew it would probably be useful in all sorts of ways. And at the same time, I thought uh, an old chap with a collection is a bit boring. Uh, you have to actually know something about what's in the in the collection. So I've been frantically spending the last three or four years uh, writing what I hope will be a, a decent book about Huxley, a useful tool for bachelor's students. Um, and the uh, second book I hope to be able to complete at some stage is a, a, a new study of his major novels, uh, which also reflects um, what research has uh, churned up in the last 20 or 30 years. Um, and, uh, and finally, just for the purposes, for internal purposes at the school, I, I hope to produce a decent life and works. Right. But the main thing to me is to try to uh, do all this and at the same time engage teenagers, because that's something uh, uh, literary societies seem not to do. Um, and uh, it's something I haven't seen museums uh, try either. Um, and the problem is that uh, we're facing a young generation who are uh, less familiar with uh, reading um and uh less inclined to use uh reading as a as a way to reflect uh than maybe the generation uh in their teens 50 years ago right oh. so, so i think it's a very interesting thing to try and a very you know terrifyingly daunting but yeah involving thing to try and worthwhile yeah. Mm -hmm. So basically, you said that you got really the, the first book. When did you read the Brave New World? I think that's the first book of Oxley for for the vast majority of people. That would be the first book, perhaps. Yeah, that would have been in the in the nineteen seventies. Nineteen seventies, right? Hmm. I found it an easy read, and uh, I did. I didn't think it was, you know, it, it merited too much further thought. Um, I, I enjoyed reading it uh, at the time. It seemed a little bit uh, flimsy in, in parts. Um, and, um, and and later on, to my great amusement, I discovered that Huxley regarded it as his weakest book. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. I, I, can, I can see that point, mm -hmm. yes. <laughs> but what... what, what... Uh, what was the book that you really, really got you, got you, got you in, in, into him? What, what, what was the first book that really kind of resonated with you? Well, uh, one of the first books um, that I ended up enjoying was um, Chrome Yellow. Uh -huh. um, That's a quite because, a one, right? Yeah, it's it's his earliest novel, and and it seemed to me that well. Uh, if he was as entertaining and witty uh, as that, it was probably a good idea to carry on following my father's book through its endless chapters. Uh, and on I went to, to Antique Hay and so on. Right. So I, I read all the works chronologically. I took it chronologically, uh, quite uh, yeah. systematically. Oh, well. Well. I, I, I sort of um, um, stuck to the novels first. Mm -hmm. uh, and then added the short stories and only later the essays. Right. Uh, anything, Rubin? Yeah, you touched already this teenager spot. Uh, that was for me very fascinating that when this, on this opening part uh, in the Zurich University, those new uh, teenagers or, or those young people were having discussion about Huxley's. Uh, uh, the whole panel of them. Yeah, a whole yeah. panel of, of those Huxley's uh, books. And um, I understood that they are members of Huxley Club. That could you, yes. yeah, could you tell us what is his purpose of Huxley Club and, and who could be members of Huxley's? What was the idea to establish his Huxley yeah. Club? Yeah. Well, um, the idea is that uh, the Zurich center uh uses teenagers 
as guides. So when we have visits from schools, um, visits from groups of university students, um, they are the ones uh, who um, show uh, visitors around the museum. Um, the plan is that I will give an introduction and then the students uh, play the part of the guide. Uh, very much the way they did when we opened the center, right? Because uh, uh, that's that's what they what they did. So in order to uh, know more about um, what the center contained, um, it seemed to me it would be a good idea to uh, give a series of, of lectures to them about uh, Huxley's major novels. So um, I took them all the way through uh, the novels from Chrome Yellow to um, Ireland. Uh, I skipped The Genius and the Goddess and I skipped A Fidescence, um, sadly in a way, but, um, but there we go. Just to give them the overall view of, um, of, of what the museum contains, I added uh, short stories, um, Ends and Means, the political essays written in the late 30s under perennial philosophy, plus The Doors of Perception and the Question of Drugs. So, so that gave them a, a fairly good overall view, a bird's eye view of, of, of what's in Huxley. And um, uh, to me, it was the first experience ever of uh, talking to teenagers about Huxley, and I wasn't sure whether it could even be done because um, uh, I'm, I'm not aware of anyone who's tried that before me. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, from uh, judging from what we saw a few weeks back, that has went quite well. I, uh, what's your impression? You've you've been able you sh you've surely have been able to establish contact uh, on on Huxley's basis. Well, far more interesting than my lectures, it seemed to me, was what teenagers actually responded. Mm -hmm. um, and through their responses, I was able to get a better impression of their, their world, the, the world they live in, which is similar to mine, I imagine, in the 1970s and yet vastly different. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. For instance, uh, in, in the 70s, um, the big topics would have been uh, nuclear power going against it, um, uh, Marxism, communism versus capitalism, um, and then uh, alternative lifestyles, um, and um, uh, fashion, for instance, um, uh, would have been a very uninteresting thing for uh, the more in intellectual uh, youngsters. Um, all the consumer goods and the way you, your image uh, um, and, and such like. And, and these days, I, I see a return of a political interest in teenagers. Um, uh, not surprisingly, there's Greta Thunberg who helped start it, there's the wars in the Middle East uh, that certainly did something, there's a war in Ukraine, and of course there's a whole terror to do with, with global warming. So um, uh, it's, it's, I, I, I think teenagers are now rediscovering an interest in politics. It's just a different kind of interest to the uh, interest uh, we had in the 70s. It's less ideological, I would say, and certainly less colored by, uh, for instance, Marxism. Uh, so uh, listening to the panel, I think, was an experience that might have been interesting to everyone there. Yeah, uh, just, just, you know, just, just to see how they respond to, to Ireland, for instance, and what they find interesting in Ireland. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> uh, well, uh, Politics came up. We don't we don't talk about politics in our newspaper, and this uh, interview will appear in the newspaper, uh, let alone party politics, but uh, local party politics and and politics in general. But th in this case, 
in Oxley's case, I would make the the the, the exception and would be very primarily to, uh, as we agreed to the interview. I said that my my our primary interest would be Huxley's uh, political uh, thought and particularly his uh, uh, politics of ecology. And uh, it would be a nice way to to segue from uh, where where we are now into that. Uh, what? Uh, how would you? How would you describe? Or uh, I, I, I just read, as I said, I read uh, after many a summer, and I think William Proctor uh, says quite. Yeah. He's quite a uh, alter ego there, I guess. But so I have some, and and of course uh, I have some uh, some vague idea what this uh, political views might be. But we'd be very interested to to hear your in general, and then uh, particularly as it applies to ecology. Um. Huxley joined the Fabian Society uh, while at Oxford. So uh, he would have started out as something like a liberal socialist um, in the First World War. Um, uh, the end of the First World War uh, and in the very early 20s, when he wrote Chrome Yellow, um, you would find traces of, of that kind of Fabianism in, uh, in, in the book. Um, for instance, the flirt of the political left such as H.G. Wells, with caste societies. Mm -hmm. Because um, in the early 20s, the likes of George Bernard Shaw and H.G. Wells and others um, thought that liberal democracies were precarious. You know, Mussolini had just started in uh, Italy. Uh, the March on Rome, I think, is in 23, something like that. And uh, uh, Germany was a mess. France was in constant um, uh, chaos. Um, and in England, uh, you had uh, uh, class warfare. Um, in Italy, the Biennio Rosso, which preceded Mussolini, was anarchist sort of uh, seizing on uh, the factories. So in, in that kind of chaos in, in Europe and uh, fears that liberal democracies might be too weak. Um, there, there were maybe dreams of alternative societies based on, on castes where, where people uh, did what they were destined by nature to do. Um, so it's not just the fascists who had such ideas. Uh, there were quite a few on, on the left. and and. Those views are caricatured in Chrome Yellow. Uh, Huxley makes fun uh, of uh, Mr. Scogan's rational state uh, and its caste system. Um, uh, he, he makes fun of H.G. Wells's samurai, uh, you know, dreams. Um, well, and then uh, you go on to antique hay where you encounter a communist tailor uh, who isn't really a communist but uh, he likes communism because if communism came in he was his cockney accent wouldn't look quite so inferior to the to the aristocrats with their beautiful posh received pronunciation accent their queen's english um, again he's caricaturing um, uh, views and on you go to uh, point counterpoint where you have Lord Tantamount, who is an aristocratic eccentric. Huxley loved aristocratic eccentrics. At the same time, of course, he was a Fabian at heart, just a little bit. So, so how could you love aristocratic eccentrics? Well, Huxley just took the liberty of doing just that and writing, praising them in his essays, saying that they were part of a of a reservation like the Indians, you know, uh, and, and that they were a, a, a threatened species. On the other hand, uh, there's a communist assistant, a lab assistant, 
who, who serves Lord Tamter Mountain, and his commons views are made fun of. And if you forward wind from there to uh, Eilis in Gaza, fun is made of a German communist uh, who's Ecke Giesebrecht, who's actually afterwards killed by uh, the Gestapo in in uh, just just outside Basel of all places. Um, so throughout these novels, uh, Huxley makes fun of all ideologies, and and you can see there that if if Huxley did in fact join the Fabian Society, he never really bought into the ideology of Fabianism enough to be a committed Fabian. Um, uh, and under the influence of D. H. Lawrence in the late twenties, I would say his his political affili affiliations became even vaguer until uh, Hitler came to power. Mm -hmm. uh, that shocked Huxley so much that just for a bit, in the uh, mid-30s, uh, he was joining the calls for a planned society in England, a five-year plan, all these Fabian, uh, you know, um, uh, 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 ideals. Uh, he briefly helped to promote them. Um, but then, uh, by the time he wrote Ends and Means, which is his political manifesto, um, he'd basically disowned uh, Fabianism because uh, as Stalin um, uh, tightened his ruthless grip on Russia um, and uh, Hitler, um, became more of a force to reckon with. Uh, one of the greatest dangers uh, to Huxley seemed uh, was, was neither communism nor fascism as such, but statism. Uh, so uh, as he moved to uh, the United States in 1937 and personally met Ralph Borsodi, uh, author of uh, School for Living, um, he, um, well, at that point, he'd already converted to something he describes as, by uh, himself as philosophic anarchism. Mm -hmm. um, it's the anarchism of uh, Proudhon, Bakunin, um, uh, um, and, sorry, uh, not Bakunin, uh, Proudhon Kropotkin, mm -hmm. uh, uh, not the anarchism, the violent anarchism of Bakunin. Uh, never. Um, and in Ends and Means, you have uh, a first taste of philosophic anarchism that you will encounter verbatim in After Many a Summer. Um, and uh, later on, uh, in a more elaborate version in uh, Ireland, um, his last utopia. So what are the main elements of his philosophic anarchism? The first is decentralism. Um, it's a, a relatively extreme form of um, uh, decentralism. Perhaps uh, uh, Switzerland could be seen as an approximation where you have the minimum of uh, power uh, in uh, the central state and its uh, administration and a maximum of power in uh, local authorities and and local communities, so it's it's a it's a decentral society uh, that applies not just to political power but also to the production of energy, um, uh, the production of the manufacturing of goods, uh, and uh, and the distribution of goods because um, Huxley already knew in the, in the late 30s that part of the problem um, facing mankind and the reason why there were wars uh, was uh, the concentration of capital in big business and the concentration of power in big state. Um, and later on in his essays, he would add uh, in, in the 40s and 50s, uh, the concentration of uh, natural resources, uh, and in particular fossil fuels in certain areas. Um, so 
uh, decentralism made a lot of sense to Huxley because he, he was convinced that wars were started uh, because of global supply chains uh, um, and uh, wars were waged over natural resources concentrated in certain parts of the world, but not in others. So the more uh, energy uh, and the more uh, things were produced uh, locally, uh, the less uh, risk there was of, of, of um, global conflicts. Um, so the decentralism is linked to another central uh, pillar in his political uh, thought, which is pacifism. Um, uh, and then you've got a further um, pillar, which is to do with the following. Um, wars are not just started because um, of global supply chains and uh, and such like, and the concentration of power in large organizations and big states. Wars are started because of human nature, because um, humans are governed by their ordinary self, uh, which is so hypnotized uh, by its, uh, the ego is so hypnotized by itself um, that um, uh, humans are likely to start conflicts well, because out of, out of selfishness, really, out of self-centeredness. -cent so in order to avert the risk of war, um, it's pointless to reorganize the economy or the state or education. You also have to try to change uh, uh, the way human are, humans are psychologically. Mm -hmm. That's why he talks in uh, the 1930s, in 37, when war is already imminent, of of meditation, individual and in groups, and why his pacifist pamphlets that he uh, produced for the British Peace Pledge Union are full of uh, uh, spiritual practices. Um, so that's the, th the third pillar of um, um, uh, de de decentralism and um, um, and um, it, it, it's it's the, it's changing uh, the way the way humans are. You can't really say changing human nature, but changing the human psyche. Well, and uh, for that to to be doable, um, uh, uh, man had to um, needed coordinating philosophy uh, on which. Um, a better world could be uh, created. In other words, um, that was uh, something he announced as, a, as an aim in ends and means, and then did in the perennial philosophy in uh, in, in, in 1945. Um, the um, essential part of um, Axis political thinking, apart from uh, decentralism and um, changing human nature, pacifism, um, uh, is, is also, uh, and, and, and spirituality, uh, is the whole relation between man and nature. Um, that's also a crucial part of his coordinating philosophy. Um, in the perennial philosophy, um, the relationship between man and nature is defined not by the Judeo-Christian tradition in which man is regarded as master of nature, but rather by religions of divine immanence. Mm -hmm. uh, in other words, uh, God in matter, God in nature, God in organic life. Um, uh, Humans, therefore, are not masters of nature, they are part of nature. Um, and that understanding, which is common in Taoism, uh, in Mahayana Buddhism, and in Vedanta, where Brahman, the ocean, uh, relates to the ripples and waves on the surface of uh, material life, um, well, Th those religions are, as it were, the underpinnings of uh, of, of, of the perennial philosophy and also uh, um, of his 
take on science. That's another pillar in his political thinking because uh, science uh, has to be based on ethical values. Uh, the ethical values propounded in the perennial philosophy, for instance, um, uh, such as treating nature decently and uh, not um, using science to blow up the planet, uh, but rather to uh, feed uh, the human race, uh, create conditions in which humans can live harmoniously with nature and not ruin their environment. Um, and live respectfully uh, amongst um, uh, uh, other other species. Um, so uh, ecology is the very natural corollary of uh, the perennial philosophy. It's, it's all linked, in other words. And finally, um, uh, a facet that is less discussed in um, ends and means, but central to his political uh, thinking is his image of the human psyche. Um, the model of the human mind body uh, is outlined in the doors of perception, more as a sketch, and later refined in his famous essay, Education, of an amphibian. Um, and it's a model of the mind, which I find absolutely extraordinary. It goes from uh, the ordinary self uh, with which we live in everyday life. It's a sort of completely chaotic uh, series of states with very little to um, help these states hang together, apart from the body, maybe. Mm -hmm. um, then there's a um, personal conscious, uh, that's the domain of psychoanalysis. Um, then under that is the physiological intelligence, which actually manages the mind-body, unbeknownst to the ego, which knows nothing about the physiological intelligence and doesn't particularly care. And then it gets really interesting, because beyond that, you've got the place where great works of art and great uh, philosophical insights are conceived, such as, for instance, um, a new uh, model for an ideal society. And then beyond that, you've got the visionary world, and finally, uh, the clear uh, the world of archetypes, and finally, the clear light of the void. So man, in other words, is a creature that spans um, everything from a totally blind, um, relatively ignorant, small ego to literally the clear light of the void, which is also at the heart of the universe. In other words, you've got in that uh, model of the mind body, you've got um, a model of the universe. Huxley hated cosmologies, and he didn't want to go anywhere near theosophy, so he never fleshed out those implications in order not to, you know, um, uh, uh, tarnish himself uh, um, as, as, a, as a theosophist. Um, but for, for, for politics, of course, this is extraordinarily important. In other words, if you uh, create a, poli a, a political theory based just on the ordinary self, um, and most political theories try that um, yeah. and basically come up with wonderful plans to reorganize an economy or uh, arrange uh, power differently, uh, the institutions uh, differently. Well, uh, that only addresses a tiny fraction of the human mind body and uh, in other words, a real attempt at an ideal society has to include all the levels of uh, man, the multiple amphibian. And, and that's where Huxley, to me, gets so profoundly interesting. And and you, you see all that in his last uh, ideal society in Ireland. It is genuinely an ideal society which addresses all levels 
of the human mind body. And that sets it apart from uh, Plato's Republic or uh, Campanella's City of the Sun or uh, even Thomas More's Utopia, which know nothing of, uh, uh, or don't mention the, the, the lower levels of, of the human mind body. And therefore, fortunately, as Berdyaev argues, um, uh, haven't been implemented. Um, in other words, in what, studying different. Sorry. In what, in what book does Berdyaev make this argument? Can you? Can you? Um, I'd have to reach for Berdyaev. But that's it, said, yeah. but, uh, he he's he's quoted in the 1946 edition of Brave New World in the foreword. Okay. Uh, Huxley quotes Berdyaev. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Well, thanks. Yeah. And he says that one of the worst things about utopias is, Berdyaev argues, that there's a risk that they might be uh, um, actually turned into, you know, realities. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, um, to me, um, the the political uh, uh, thought of, of, of Huxley is, is so very original and very unusual, precisely because it's so um, uh, all-embracing, so holistic. Mm -hmm. uh, I, th I think we'll have to search quite a bit to find a political thinker who's as holistic as that. And um, critics have just, you know, basically um, pecked um, uh, Ireland to death because they try to um, judge it uh, in terms just of the novel uh, of, of, of traditional literature, shall we say, or modernist literature. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, um, complain that there's too much philosophy in it, there's too much um, uh, discursive thinking in it. And um, but if you compare to the other great utopias like Plato's Republic, I know I don't know how you feel, but I, I I'd, I'd far rather reread Ireland. I've read it six <laughs> times. I've never been bored. Yeah, yeah. that's true. Yeah. yeah, I would like to turn from politics to art. <laughs> uh, I I read this um, uh, doors of perception several times. And what is mirroring from this book to me that this Oxley's two desires, desire to see and desire to paint. And uh, for me, this source of perception is somehow book of literature. And when we visited this, not literature, but uh, yeah, art, painting. painting, yeah. And when we visited this Huxley Center, I found on the wall one Huxley's paint painting yes um, i would like to ask that what is this uh yeah please tell uh, us okay. actually as a painter yeah. or art art in, uh, interested person oh, very much um art uh music um and you know higher uh, phil philosophy um both originate uh, they, they originate in uh, a very deep layer of the subconscious mm -hmm. um actually would say that the best art is created um below the physiological um intelligence probably in something more like the collective subconscious he doesn't name the place exactly, but he says that below the physiological intelligence is uh, the place where great art is created and where the greatest insights are conceived. Now, that's several layers below the ordinary mind and several layers below the, the ego. In other words, the ego can't create great art. It can't create great music. And people who try to force that by practicing and practicing for decades, fail miserably. Um, uh, uh, not just is talent uh, needed, uh, uh, it, 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 there has to be something like, in Huxley's thinking, an opening um, in which 
the uh, the ordinary self is made passive, um, in which it becomes calm, and uh, room is created for uh, great artistic insights and uh, um, uh, so a great great artistic inspiration. In other words, uh, great art comes to the artist, and great music comes to the composer. Uh, it's not as if he can actually force it to happen. It's uh, very close to what he says of grace. Um, in other words, um, uh, experiences of the divine are similar in that they uh, cannot be forced and made by the ordinary self. Uh, they are only possible when the ordinary self becomes passive and allows them to actually happen. So art and music have a very high standing in Huxley's thinking. Obviously, uh, being half blind, uh, painting, uh, ha uh, you know, uh, uh, constituted other challenges, mm -hmm. um, presented other challenges. Um, uh, he also played the piano, Huxley, by the way, and uh, he was a music critic. He was an art critic in the 20s, uh, which, which, of course, all helped to give him an absolutely fantastic uh, knowledge of of music and his friendship with Stravinsky uh, did a great deal in the uh, 40s and 50s. And um, and then there were uh, all sorts of friendships with, with painters, with the art scene, with art critics um, that made Huxley into something of an art expert at some point. So art and music have a very, very high standing in Huxley. Uh, art is not for art's sake. Uh, art because it comes from such an extraordinary uh, part of the human uh, psyche, uh, is actually something sacred. Art has meaning. Uh, and in order to be uh, great art, um, uh, art has to have a lot of meaning at all levels of the um, human mind body, all the way from the ordinary self uh, and its workings right up to the, uh, well, not quite the clear light of the void. That's where art and music stop uh, because they are limited to the visionary, in other words, to the du dualistic uh, part of, of the human psyche. The actual unitive knowledge is something beyond painting and music, but something that uh, uh, music and art can actually touch on, allude to at least, intimate. Uh, at least obliquely. Mm -hmm. um, so um, art was also to Huxley therapy in the mid thirties, because um, after Brave New World and that horrible uh, bout of insomnia that he that he suffered and uh, the fears that he might never be able to write again, that was just before um, Eilis in Gaza. It took four years to complete Eilis in Gaza, also because of that crisis. Well. A painting was part of the way, uh, including the painting at the center, uh, which which had a, a healing effort, uh, something maybe which also presented a holiday from words. That's why so many writers, I think, paint, you know, all the way from Hesse through to D.H. Lawrence or Goethe even. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so, um, or Blake, uh, for that matter. Ah. Um, so uh, there's, there's endless writers who, who paint. So it's a holiday from, from language, a holiday from literature. Um, and it's also um, experienced this extraordinary um, uh, challenge uh, that you face if you stand between uh, the verbal and conceptual knowledge and uh, the, the nonverbal, holistic, uh, um, impression. In other words, you might say the great painting comes close to what Huxley calls the state of understanding, um, in which uh, impressions, as in the doors of perception, are uh, not channeled through language and not challenged through conceptual thought, but allowed to directly um, um, uh, enter enter the mind, like Van Gogh's chair, for instance, which is a perfect illustration of, of that. In Now, in art, as in music, Huxley distinguishes between 
at least two forms of spirituality, and you find it clearly set out in the laws of perception. One is the is art, uh, which happens when you withdraw from everyday life, uh, from real life, into an ideal spiritual Shangri-La. It's what Huxley calls the art of the Arhat, uh, the Hinayana uh, Buddhist saint, in other words. Mm -hmm. um, then there's the other kind of art. For instance, Sung dynasty landscapes are likened to the art of the Arhat in the doors of perception. Uh, and then on the other, you've got uh, art which is both enlightened and at the same time in real life. Uh, two examples of that in um, uh, the doors of perception are Vuya and his interiors of uh, bourgeois homes, which are so lum as luminous as Van Gogh's chairs. And the other is Rembrandt, um, uh, the uh, painting about, uh, I, I believe it's called Rêve du Philosophe, um, where you've got, the, again, the full uh, picture of, of the human mind body, all the way from the ordinary self to the very highest levels. So Huxley said that there was a scale of perfection mm -hmm. in uh, art and in music. The more levels of the mind body that art was able to touch, the better. Mm -hmm. In other words, the greatest art touched all levels of the human mind body and uh, uh, great art, but not quite so. Uh, extraordinary, touched only parts. And the very worst art was li limited just to the ordinary self. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, one quote from, from the same book, actually quoting Goethe, uh -huh. yeah. uh, where Goethe saying, we are talking too much, uh, we, ha we have to, we should uh, paint or draw more. Or draw more. And it's yes. also uh, relies to education, uh, educational system. Oh, yes. Yeah, implies, yeah. Implies, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, that that is, our, our educational system is too cognitive. Uh, yes. That how, well, how, as, as you are running but... private private school, that what is its implication to, to, to your... Uh, Has it affected your uh, curriculum there? Well, apart from the uh, club, of course, which you do. Yeah, I'd, I'd say in, 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 in a very limited way, because um, what I fear very much is um, movements in education which try to foster spirituality. Mm -hmm. um, that, to me, is taboo. Um, because I'm always worried about who is going to be doing that. Mm -hmm. You know, for instance, if we say, as a school, we want to cultivate mindfulness, it's very fashionable now. There's even uh, a British um, mindfulness policy for state schools. Um, there's certified mindfulness coaches operating in the British educational system. Uh, to, to me, that's a highly suspect thing. I, I, I can see that one might want to use certain forms of meditation or certain forms of calming and concentrate relaxation, shall we say, physical relaxation to improve uh, learning, yes, and maybe improve exam performance. But, but uh, that's the sort of borderland between techniques and uh, an actual spirituality which has to go way beyond techniques. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm always wondering, you know, can we really borrow from uh, the most sacred religious traditions, bits and bobs that suit us, in order to help students get through exams? So um, I, 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 don't, I don't think that's what my school tries too much of, uh, but... Um, what we do try is to have a better balance of humanities and sciences. Uh, that's something that was very important to Huxley and uh, to to offer at least some ways 
to um, uh, translate learning into practice, into action. Uh, for instance, uh, reading about Plato and then debating Plato in the debate society. But other schools do that too. Um, perhaps there's a little Huxley thread that runs through the curriculum uh, because of because the centers of the school. So everyone gets to see it and everyone gets a little introduction to it. Um, yeah, and then there's many areas which I would in a way like to draw closer to, but I find it very difficult to try that. For instance, uh, the Alexander technique, um, like the, the American educational philosopher John Dewey, actually was convinced that the Alexander technique ought to be uh, mandatory, uh, obligatory in, in, in all kinds of education, uh, together possibly with the Bates method, because people have a problem using their eyes. And um, uh, maybe uh, more uh, esoteric forms of uh, concentration, such as um, techniques, such as, for instance, deep hypnosis. But I wouldn't dare, you know, uh, um, <laughs> putting students into deep hypnosis, let alone myself, <laughs> um, as, it, as it's done in, in Ireland. Um, I think, I think it, in, in his educational um, out, out, outline of, of a better education, actually uh, tells us what ideally uh, education would be. And uh, I would say that practically I'm able to probably implement more like 10% if I'm very lucky. Uh, well, our, our hour is almost up. Um, uh, went has been very fast this time. Um, uh, one of our guest lecturers in our course on actually that we have said something on these lines that uh, while uh, philo uh, perennial philosophy is about uh, what so should they say lighter side of spiritual life the devils of ludun deal with the darker side of spirituality uh would you i'd like you to comment on that uh on that uh, uh thought and and uh, in, in the course of this also give your opinion of these two books are they kind of opposites of each other or Well, the relation between the perennial philosophy and Grey Eminence, the biography of uh, um, Cardinal Richelieu's right-hand man, Père Joseph, um, is about the tragedy that occurs when a practicing mystic tries to engage in power politics uh -huh. because Père Joseph is a genuine mystic. Unfortunately, uh, his um, religious practices are um, limited a bit too much by, by a personal god, uh, a personal god of Roman Catholicism in, in his case. Um, and an obsession with the um, with Calvary, with the passion of Christ, uh, which makes him relatively inhuman when it comes to other people's sufferings, because it all seems so much less than the suffering of Jesus Christ. So there's, there's at least two two dimensions there. The first is the tragedy when a mystic tries to um, become involved in power politics, and the second is. Uh, the difficulty of reconciling mysticism with traditional religion. Mm -hmm. um, the dark night of the soul is what it's uh, frequently referred to in the perennial philosophy. Now in The Devils of Ludam, um, you have again uh, a protagonist who has uh, genuine talent as a, as a, as a mystic, uh, unfortunately, he gets carried away by uh, the belief that he can't really be harmed by real life and that somehow it will all end quite well. Um, 
the background to um, the Devils of Ludan is, is again the same Cardinal Richelieu and great eminence, great eminence. And um, Huxley interpreted the Devils of Ludan as an experiment by Richelieu to see how far he could go uh, in uh, murdering a relatively innocent uh, member of the church uh, without there being a rebellion. Um, there's another aspect, though, in Devils of Ludin, which is very, very uh, uh, important to Huxley, which was the whole question of crowd insanity. Uh, that's in the Ursuline Monastery. Um, and uh, Huxley believed that uh, Nazi fascism and, and Stalinism thrived on crowd insanity by act actively cultivating it. And, th and there's a book in Huxley's library, uh, Philippe de uh, Felice, uh, a, fr a French political philosopher uh, about who describes the, uh, this phenomenon, the phenomenon of crowd intoxication, crowd poisoning. Um, so that's a very, very important aspect of uh, the Devils of Luda. The dark side of um, uh, mysticism, I wouldn't see in the Devils of Luda. Um, what What is the dark side of, of mysticism at worst? You can see it in, in Ireland, in that last experience of the Moksha medicine. It's, uh, it's seeing uh, that uh, praying mantis um, and the sheer enormity of the female praying mantis that bites off the head of, of its uh, male uh, lover. Um, the whole um, impossibility of, of really understanding uh, nature and the workings of nature, if, if you look at it just from a, a human point of view. Um, but then there can be no dark side from a certain level on, onwards, because what is unitive knowledge, if not uh, the actual resolution of all uh, dualities and uh, all um, opposites into, into the clear light of the void? In other words, at the very highest level, there is no dark side. Mm. Um, mm. Good point. There is just pure energy, pure consciousness and pure, pure bliss. Mm. Right, or oh. Plato. Yeah. Uh, Plato, ideal forms. Yeah. Uh, the form of the good, if in, in, in that uh, in that uh, terminology. Yes, um, Huxley doesn't like Plato one bit, and trashes him at every op uh, every opportunity, because uh, he believes that. Um, Life cannot be understood through uh, ideas, through extreme idealism. Um, matter is infinitely fine uh, to the point where it becomes not material, but something else. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not just the whole uh, wave particle debate to do with light, say, in... Um, Einstein or in uh, quantum physics. Uh, it's also something that goes way beyond that uh, to, uh, to unitive experience. Mm. In other words, the universe is made up of something uh, that uh, unifies it. The question is, is it an idea? Um, is it matter? We can't say. Mm. Um, and to Huxley, that is one of the great mysteries. Mm -hmm. So, so he'll be more more closer to Aristotle than on 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 the scale of Plato than uh, uh, Aristotle Plato scale. He'll be Huxley would be more on on the Aristotle side or 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 outside of the scale altogether. Well, the bit that Huxley likes about Aristotle is uh, is his poetics, uh, the idea that uh, art can be cathartic mm. um uh he 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 misses that in, in plato's philosophy 
Right. But but to him, the, the whole question of whether uh, the world can be explained through idealism or, or materialism is meaningless because at the end of the day, um, ideas are material and it's quite possible that in the human mind, ideas, feelings and such like um, have a chemical equivalent, mm -hmm. uh, a, a chemical analog. That's something that's mentioned in the laws of perception. And on the other hand, uh, whatever we call matter is infinitely fine and behaves more and more unusually to the point where it's more like Alice in Wonderland uh, at the subatomic level um, or the, uh, you know, the, the verses of Edward Lear. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. so, so the distinction to Huxley is... Is, is is meaningless at, at, at a certain point. I, I think I I, do, I don't think he could have wholeheartedly have said that he was either a Platonist idealist or yeah. a Kantian idealist, yeah. or on the other hand, more of a materialist. Yeah. Dean Radin in the last interview talked about uh, dual aspect monism, which is kind of I think uh, yes uh, goes into that. Uh, I, if I may, just a very brief question. I started to read uh, first the uh, after many a summer because. German Wikipedia said that uh, William, uh, the prototype of, uh, was it William Brockton? Brock, Brock, yeah. Is uh, Gerald Hurd. Have you, I, I didn't find anything from, I, I, I looked it uh, into your father's book and I didn't find that. So have you, what you, uh, have you heard of this? And, and what do you think, what do you know of Gerald Hurd and, and his uh, influence on Huxley? Yeah, that would be the very last question. Uh, Gerald Hurd would have had a, a very strong influence on on Huxley because uh, they met uh, in the uh, early 30s. Um, it was Hurd who um, encouraged Huxley to join the Peace Pledge Union. Um, the Huxleys and Hurd traveled to America together in 37, and the plan was to um, uh, go on a lecture tour together to promote pacifism. Um, Ends and Means happened as a book in 1937 because uh, Huxley was unable to produce the same thing together with him. Um, some critics have tried to argue that Hurd was like a guru figure in Huxley's life. Um, I don't really think so because uh, the kind of mysticism that Hurd practiced uh, was not the sort of mysticism that Huxley practiced. It, it was far more radical. It was more monastic. And that's uh, when, when, when Hurd um, started his community in 42, the Trabuco Monastery, um, uh, Huxley was, of course, very supportive of it because he hoped that Hurd wouldn't be able to create a, a community of uh, dedicated uh, individuals who were able to uh, maybe uh, become uh, more enlightened and then help the world to become more peaceful. Um, but the, the experiment didn't actually last for too long. It, it, it folded after about a year, I think. And, um, and, and at a certain point, Gerald Hurd turned to science fiction. Mm -hmm. uh, and became a science fiction writer. Um, when Huxley's house uh, burned down in 1961, uh, Huxley lived with Gerald Hurd, so they were still close friends, uh, that very much. I have to say, if I read the perennial philosophy, um, I feel profoundly touched. If I read what Proctor says about spirituality, I'm touched. If I read Gerald Hurd's books, I find they're very, very wordy, um, and they go on for ages. He, there's a whole shelf of books in the, at the Huxley Center written by Hurd. Uh, I wouldn't, I don't feel tempted to read any of those books. That's what I also read. That they, they are quite unreadable, <laughs> isn't he? And so, who were then the the real spiritual? guys in Huxley's life. The first was his wife, Maria. Uh, she had this full-blown mystical experience in, in 1942. If you have that 
you know, in your partner at home. Uh, Jesus, that makes a difference, doesn't it? And then the other I would have thought, not a guru necessary, but a fellow seeker, that's Krishnamurti, no doubt. Um, so in Propter, there is a touch of Gerald Hurd, definitely. Um, uh, there's also an awful lot of Ralph Borsodi. Um, and there might even be a touch of, um, you know, Dick Shepard and his pacifism. Um, but Propter is uh, just as much about politics as he is about uh, spirituality. And the political side, Gerald Hurt had very little to say about. Well, thank you so much for your time. Uh, it was really a great opportunity for us because we are in the midst of this course and that uh, interview, apart from it uh, appearing in a newspaper, was very, very timely and uh, and um, most helpful in in, in uh, steering the course uh, course uh, uh, of that course. So thank you so much and. Uh, and, thank you, uh, thank you for the job you are doing with teenagers, yes, teenagers yeah, especially. Was very, very.